so this is going to be our last in-person meeting uh, for the semester, unless for some reason Temple decides to lift it. Um, and I should say that, like, again, I was kind of, I, I'm kind of just totally ready for this, or prepared, I should say. Um, honestly, should not be as excited about this as I currently am. Um, but, like, I've been teaching, um, I've been recording my lectures for a while. First semester here in 2016, I was asked to teach a course remotely in Japan, and then no students signed up for that, but the remote recording stuff was already present, so I went ahead and recorded my lectures for my data structure students anyway. And then I proceeded to do that for all my classes because that made sense. It seemed like a great tool. Also, my wife was pregnant at the time. Um, she gave birth in 2017, and, you know, when it's your first kid, you kind of get a bit paranoid. Just a bit. Right. Uh, so I'm like, well, if you're sick, don't come to class. And if you're sick, here's going to be the recorded lecture so that you don't come to class. So I've been recording my lectures for a while. I was using Panopto for a while. Um, and then because I play video games, I knew about OBS. So I, you, that's what I used to record right, my lectures right here. So that's... Um, how I've done that. And eventually what that led to was me creating um, a bunch of flipped lectures that were, okay, let's see. Let's see. I don't know why it, what, what this, how the suggestions it gives me works. So, but if I go to my library of videos that I've done, right, I had these flipped le lectures for data structure and basically they were 10 to 20 minute videos, basically you'd watch a certain number of videos per week and I would tell and I'd tell the students, hey, you're responsible for these lectures each week. I'd record them over the weekend and say, this is this week's content. So, um, blah, blah, blah. Where is it? Uh, class recordings for data structures? No. Flipped lectures for data structures because the order this stuff is in is totally. So, most of the, so a lot of the videos just looked like this, where it would, come on, you can do it, you can load. Um, or they'd be recorded in my house, right? All right now, so before we, right, so they'd be recorded in my house where I'd be doing this. Here I am, touching my face, you know, which I, which apparently you do about like 2,000 times a day. So yeah, don't think about a pink elephant. So you know, uh, the... Um, and then basically that got adopted to us. Uh, we started doing an online master's in ISMT here, and I'm like, great, I've already got these videos so we can start piloting it. And then I was told to redo the videos along with, as well, providing me with these nice high quality intro videos that I did. Um, but like my recording setup generally looks some, uh, ends up being something along the, more along the lines like uh, this. So this is the kind of videos that I'm able to record nowadays, where if you so watch this Twitch, is this is much more Twitch-like, you know. It's amazing what happens when you, when, when you get access to a good microphone, a good web camera, and, uh, and a green screen, but very terrible lighting. All right, and I've moved locations, so the lighting uh, solution will be different. But suffice to say, I'm very comfortable with doing these lectures, these kinds of lectures. Notice that these videos, if you can, I'll zoom in here. Um, you know, we've got a three minute lecture, a 17 minute lecture where I'm talking about the introduction, and then the rest of these are like nine, eight, six, five. So they don't go above 20 minutes, right? So I'm, in other words, what I'm trying to say is I'm very comfortable like giving these kinds of things, uh, doing these kinds of things. And, you know, so at least for this class, at least for this class, you can be assured that you're going to get top quality education stuff that you would be expecting for an in-person lecture. Um, so the question is, how are we going to, um, so how is the rest of the semester work going to work for us? Um, most likely, we're going to, honestly, it's going to be a bit at touch and go because I've done Zoom with a, you know, and with like a group of 10 people. It's about 100 times more than that. So we'll see how that works. Also, I'm not going to be recording my lectures on Zoom because, uh, and then uploading them to you, YouTube because FERPA. I can't reveal, I don't want to reveal your names publicly. That's kind of like against the law and, you know. So, um, 
but what I so my plan is is that I'm going to start recording lectures this weekend for you guys like start recording lectures post them on YouTube in a playlist tell you this is your playlist for the week watch it and then on Tuesday and Thursday we'll have in class like let's say we'll try out this upcoming Tuesday and Thursday basically an in class zoom meeting at the appropriate time for our class and we'll do in class exercises like like we did for the XKCD password cracker and the blame the Pope thing so you watch the videos and you come in either to do extra we'll do exercises for a bit and then we'd work on a bit of and then you'd have the opportunity to work with your friends on home homework um, let me boot up zoom for a second over here if you haven't used zoom yet by the way um, you go to temple not Remple temple dot zoom dot us and then you can join a meeting or you can start a meeting or you can just sign in I'm just gonna sign in uh, and then what you basically will ask you to download um, something to install it on your computer or run it in your browser you can just run it in your browser if you have to I'm going to and basically the way it works is that I will send out a link it's very easy. It's my. It's this link, Prof. Andrew Rosen, over here. It will be my Zoom. The rooms that I will use for my meetings, and uh, basically, you click that, go through the motions, and you'll get a program that looks something like this. Okay. There's a couple things we can do uh, do with Zoom. So first off, um, just FYI, it does have a virtual background function. It can't read my camera right now, by the way, because I'm currently using my camera to record the lecture. So that's why it can't, you know, can't get a recordception going on. But basically what it can do is it can kind of chop out the, um, it can chop out the, your background. So if you, to some extent, if you've got a messy room. Mind you, video camera is not necessarily required, although we will put out a statement probably saying it is. It's not as required as, say, a microphone. Most webcam, most of these things have microphones. Test it out before coming to class because it will be a bit of a hassle. Um, so anyway, you can join the meeting. I'm going to start a new meeting as the host of the meeting. You don't have to join up on this. I'm just going to show you kind of what this looks like. Uh, so connecting to Zoom. Here it says I'm using the computer audio. It would normally have video, but again, I am currently using the video to record this lecture, right? Um, over here, there's this whole participants thing. You'll be able to do things. Because I'm the host, I don't have a function here, but you can li literally virtually raise your hand. And I'll be just simply scrolling through this to see if you've got questions. I can, we'll probably end up mute muting you all, especially if you, you know, since I'm sure it will be a bit hectic at home. Um, I'm sure plenty of you have annoying siblings. Um, there's go faster, go slower. But basically, you can send me kind of a, if you hit this, it'll put a little icon next to your name. To tell, let me know what you're, what's going on and what you want to happen. Okay. Uh, another thing that I can do is I can ask a question and poll people. Like, uh, um, let's see, add a question. Ooh, I have to do that. That's interesting. Edit meeting poll. You've not created any polls yet. So then I can add a poll, and then I can add answers. You know, I could ask which is the answer for that, but that's okay. Um, another thing I can do you'll see your professors do is you'll be able to record there's also a chat which is also very useful so if you want to ask a question without disrupting the class you can just simply send a message to everybody or you could send it to me or whatever you know there's ways to do that one of the features I'm looking forward to using the most though because again a hundred people is kind of terrible for like trying to all talk at once especially if I'm trying to get you to work all at once is this breakout room function which simply says, given all these participants, currently there's zero because there's nobody else here, I can say, okay, if there are 100 students, um, sorry, if there's 100 students, I'll create 25 rooms, and it will automatically sort you guys into 25 separate four-person rooms. So you guys can work on that, so you guys can work on those uh, assignments together and try to get help from each other. I will then be able to ideally jump from one to another, but of course with 25 rooms, it's a bit difficult. But yeah, there's a certain issue of scale, you might say, 
with one professor being able to jump around. But I figure if you get if we randomly dis assign four people, at least one of you is going to know what's going on. So, um, and then I can create the rooms, and then I can, uh, and then once the breakout rooms are done, I can basically say, hey, I am done with the breakout rooms, and now we'll come back here. Um, or I can tell you the other option I have is that I can use that you guys can manually go to a room. You know, so if you have a friend you really like, you know, it's nice to have friends. Great, I made myself sad. Um, it's nice to have friends. Um, no, I'm kidding. I'm, I've got plenty of friends. So, so anyway, you've got if you want. So we'll we'll experiment. This will be touch and go. But for the most part, I want to try. I don't want to like. The reason I'm going to be recording videos, I'll post them on YouTube for you guys to watch, is because I want you guys to. I'd rather. I want to make sure you learn the educational material as opposed to. Um, you know, have to struggle with this and figure out and what's going on, then miss a bunch of the educational content. So essentially, we're going to go into kind of what is a flipped classroom. Read the stuff, then do exercises. Your lab sessions will also be on Zoom. Um, they're essentially going to be turned into glorified off virtual office hours, right? Come in, ask your TA for help if you need it. I mean, th that's essentially what they are. Uh, get the ability to work with your TA if you want. Yes. How do you demo? Same way we were demoing in the first place. Uh, depending if these in-class exercises, ten, I don't, these in-class exercises, I might run them for just like 50 min, 45, 50 minutes. And in which case, I will be able to, you'll be able to demo to me. I'll also hold virtual Zoom meetings during my actual office hours, you know. So I'll run my actual office hours. You can come in and virtually demo your stuff then or to your TAs during the, you know, during their office hours, or hey, it doesn't have to be during office hours anymore. You can just simply say, hey, I'd like to demo your stuff. Can we arrange a time in the evening? Because that's what works best for me. Because now that I don't have to school, I'm going, don't have to go to school. I'm getting to sleep at four o'clock in the morning and yeah, get <laughs> adult. True story. College was terrible of experience for me. Yes. Yes. Possibly. I also there's. Uh, I think there's a way in Zoom in, on Canvas that I can schedule a Zoom meeting, and I'll see how that works out. Um, where I can just schedule one to automatically launch. You know, uh, that. But you'll most likely be getting a spam of emails. But I. That's prop. But I'll announce. So that might be the case. Um, but I'm, again, this is going to be with. With the whole foray into Zoom, that's new for me. Um, if Zoom does, the other thing I'm considering is creating a Discord channel. So, because all of y'all probably know or know Discord, so um, you know, so that way you guys can uh, ask for you know, enter a nice big chat room, ask for help, share dank memes, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, so you know, I'm 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 quite familiar with Discord. Um, so contingency plans. Zoom, I believe, does run on AWS, which means that uh, they should have plenty of, um, they should have the ability to order more bandwidth if they need to. But if that doesn't work, worst case scenario, I'm just going to start, I mean, again, we'll just move to like using um, message boards and individual exercises for that stuff or discussion boards and do this a bit more asynchronously. If I need to broadcast something, I can always use YouTube or Twitch to do that. Again, those would be announcements I would make. Um, but for right now, Zoom is the primary way to do it because we can all get into Zoom and use that platform. All right, so other questions, yes? Exam, exam. That's an excellent question. I completely forgot to get to that. Exams will be held online. I'm going to try my best to use something called Proctorio. Um, my main concern, again, is just I have two concerns primarily with doing exams online. First is getting in-person help from somebody else. Thus, it's not a representative thing of your abilities. And then second is you getting help from online by like copy-pasting the question into Fiverr and asking some guy in a third world country to give you the answer. Um, 
again, it's all back to, is this representative of your work? I'm less worried about you Googling something online during an exam because I'll probably write the exam in such a way that it will be open note, open book, and just account for that. Um, you know, not to say that's going to be harder or anything. I'm just going to not have like questions that like you could copy and paste into a Python interpreter, right? Is the kind of thing. So it's and since it'll be online, it'll be more focused on writing. Um, so you'll be able to have access to Idle or whatever tools you need. Um, I'm going to try my best to basically make it not difficult, but also representative of a way of just checking, do you know this stuff? And I do know that for a lot of you, it's one, very different to do it on paper and then do it on this exam. So we'll see how it works out. You know, I've always been leery to try it electronically, but I'll be happy to give it a try. But it will be on Canvas. Yes. I will, yes, I'm going to figure that out now. It will probably be, um, what I'll probably do is I'll ask, I'll probably create a quiz with some questions. Um, and then what I'll do is that I'll give you the chance to get extra points back. Basically, it will be the quiz. Whatever you get on the quiz, those points will get directly added to the exam up to a certain maximum, like maybe 70 or 75. And at that point, you don't get any more points. So. I'll try to figure it. I'll try to figure out something that seems, you know, okay, um, especially with regards to online. But I'm planning on still doing a, um, a thing for that. This this is really kind of um, disrupted the classroom. Uh, but I mean, that's like the least of our concerns. The I, I do want to emphasize that this is not an overreaction. Uh, many people think that like with schools and things closing, that's a bit of an overreaction. The coronavirus kills between two to four percent of those patients that have that have been diagnosed with it. That doesn't sound like much, but then you can do the math when you consider the, that the United States population is like 360 million. So that's about you know three million people dead if everybody were to be infected, which they won't. Everybody won't be infected, but that's a lot of people. But it, and again, it could should that be that the rate is much lower because, you know, the symptoms don't really sh manifest too heavily in a lot. Um, it doesn't seem anything more than a really nasty cold for a lot of people. Um, that being said, when should you go to see the hospital? I am not a physician, so this is this is just general advice, not specifically like. First off, if you want real medical advice, ask a doctor. Um, so a couple things to note here. Uh, first, if you've got a fever that will not go down, go and see a doctor. If you've got a cough in, in such a way that it's, if you are having trouble breathing, go and see the, go to the ER. Well, especially with that, those are the conditions where you want to go and go directly to the ER. If you've got a fever that you cannot control with medication, and if you have, are having trouble breathing, um, those are the conditions Otherwise, if it's a fever that you can just manage, you know, it'll be miserable, but you can probably manage it. Make sure you're not, if you're sick, that you do have people checking in on you, not even if it's just virtually, so that you won't infect them. Masks are useless, except if you're sick. The entire point of, of, of um, the entire point of having masks is so that you don't spray your, uh, spray the par uh, particles on other people. That's the entire point of masks. Essential oils will not protect you from coronavirus. <laughs> Homeopathy is a scam. It will not work and it will not help you. It is just water and sugar pills. Beware of anybody who tells you that they have a cure for this thing. I say this because there are people who believe they have cures for these things and I am very, and I have a very strong hostility towards uh, people who promote alternative medicine um, as medicine. That's not to say there are not some herbs that can help with like stuff like nausea or other things like that, but that's medicine. You know, if it's been peer reviewed and studied, then, you know, but saying, but um, let's see, what else can I say? Like, yeah, 
collodial silver will not help you. Um, would make you uh, probably would give you a bit of a, a bit of a boost of energy, but it won't cure you. Um, yes. Yep. Yep. Wash your hands frequently. More frequently. I mean, one of the things we learned is that wow, I really do not wash my hands at all, do I? Um, your cell phone is pretty filthy. Uh, I recommend maybe if you're going to use hand sanitizer or anything, I maybe use it on your phone. Um, the but 20 seconds. That's enough time to basically say the opening lines of Star Trek. So if you want to uh, singing the theme is entirely up to you um, after you do that, but doing the whole space, the final frontier, that will give you, that. that's about 20 seconds. Um, hand sanitizer really isn't necessary. Soap and water is. Uh, the reason that, that people are going for, uh, the reason there, this is gonna sound, sound silly, but the reason there's a toilet paper shortage is because there's a toilet paper shortage. It sounds really axiomatic, but basically, if you tell, say on the news that people are going mad over toilet paper, people are going to have FOMO, fear missing out, and go and get toilet paper so that there's going to be toilet paper. That's literally what this is. If I were, if the news were going to go on tonight, if I were to go on the news in, tonight and say that there's possibly going to be a shortage of toothpaste, you will see is that will create a, a shortage of toothpaste because demand for toothpaste will suddenly spike. That's the way it works. It's kind of a self-feeding cycle in those things. That is why that there is a run, there's a run on toilet paper because there is a run on toilet paper. It's just one of those interesting things about human psychology. And it's just, it's not like we all decided to go mad. It's just that we all very locally made the decision of, well, I guess I'm low on toilet paper. I only like have six rolls left, so I guess I should go out and get some now rather than risk being out of toilet paper at some other point in time. Um, other questions about coronavirus or about the way this is going to go in class? Yes? Uh, do you know how you came across the DRS? DRS. So I contacted DRS myself, actually, because I was very concerned about this. Um, so, so first off, if you need accommodations for time, it's actually very easy for us to handle that. Um, because we'll just simply set it up so that you can have extra time. Um, I think with DRS, they'll provide any service so except, except for like in-person proctoring services is what they said, but that may change. So if you have certain needs like, you know, uh, you know, like you need an alternative test format or something like that, or you need some kind of aid while taking the test, contact DRS specifically. Contact me as well because I'm not going to penalize you because DRS can't do their job. Okay? I will never penalize you because something is preventing you from getting, uh, from showing me that you've got your skills. Okay? So if you've got DRS, continue to be in contact with DRS. They said they, they, DRS wants to help students as far as I understand. It really just depends on what the regulations uh, offer that are. Other questions? Yes? Make, if you have a time, if you are going to a completely different time zone, please make me aware of, of that um, so that if you need to take the test at a separate time, you can. Like, you know, I might schedule the exam for 2 o'clock in the afternoon here, but if you're somewhere in China, that might end up being 2 o'clock in the morning, right? Not saying you specifically, but I mean, like, I've literally had to deal with, I taught, I taught remotely in Japan, right? So meeting students for an office hour with a 13-hour time difference is very interesting, let's just say. You know, we basically have to schedule it either very early on my end and late on their end or vice versa. So, you know, it's a very, it's just, so if you do have a time difference, that's an excellent question. Just be sure to let me know. Um, I will accommodate you. I will make it, I will, I will work things out. So if you have a time difference. If it's a time difference like three hours and it's not going to pose a problem, just still let me know. But if it's going to, if you feel like it's going to impose an issue, you know, tell me. You know, as long as you're upfront and forthright with me, I'm going to make this work. 
Other questions? Um, also, I should mention one of the really cool things about Zoom is that if you share your screen with me, I can request to control it. So I can go in and actually like type on your keyboard, essentially, which is really nice for correcting your mistakes very quickly. As opposed to, say, going to that line there and pointing at my screen and then realizing, wait a second, you can't see where I'm pointing. I may have done that a couple hundred times. So, you know. <laughs> it's the same reason people gesture when they're talking on the phone really mad. It doesn't really help, but you're going to do it anyway. Um, all right. So another thing I'll do is that I will assign more textbook readings. The textbook was kind of designed for a flipped classroom setting. So let's go ahead and just take a look. So today I'm going to dedicate it to learning about my favorite data structure, um, which is the dictionary or the associative array or the hash table or the hash map, as it's called in various other programming languages. Um, it is amazing. Okay. Um, now. Dictionaries are used for three things uh, primarily. Okay. Dictionaries, we will use them for, th well, before I get into them, I'm going to say these are what we use them for. Counting. Categorizing. And key value association which sounds really abstract and weird, but it's really not. It's saying basic, so the idea here between key value association, which I'll talk about first, is basically um, when, we, when you go for help, like from go to an advisor or go to like the tech support desk or to any kind of temple function, right? They're gonna ask you for your TUID, right? They typically ask you for your TUID or your TU email, right? They don't ask you for your name generally. They ask you for your ID. And this is because names are terrible at identifying people, or rather identifying people uniquely. Um, falsehood, ah, falsehoods about names, right? Falsehoods programmers believe about names which you might want to avoid. Uh, it's been translated into a lot of languages because it's extremely popular. Uh, people have exactly one canonical phone name. They, people don't have multiple names. This is false. The vast majority of women who get married take on a second name. Because, you know, patriarchy. Um, people have exactly one full name that they go by. Uh, people at this point in time have exactly one name. Also a lie, you can, some people have multiple names uh, or use separate identities for stuff. Uh, people have exactly n names for a specific value event. Oh, people values do not change, but they only change under certain sets of events. No. Uh, people's names are written in ASCII, right? Uh, let's see. People's names have an order to them. Right? Pick any ordering scheme will automatically resist, result in consistent ordering among all systems as long as both people, as both use the same ordering system scheme for the same name. Uh, this is to say that a lot, in a lot of Asian countries uh, where I'm, where if I'm introducing myself, I might introduce myself as Rosen Andrew, where I give my family name first, followed by my individual name. But if you're signing up for a system in that country, or they're signing up to here, for a system here, they go, wait, should I give my family name first or my first name first? You know, so that leads to some confusion there. Um, people's first names and last names are by, are by necessity different. Yeah. My system will never have to deal with names from China or Japan or Korea or Ireland or Russia, Sweden, Botswana, uh, the United States, Spain, Haiti, France, or the Klingon Empire, all of which have weird naming systems in common use, and that Klingon Empire thing was a joke, right? Names are tough, in other words. And not only that, unique names don't exist. I am Andrew Rosen. I believe I've shown in this class that other Andrew Rosens exist, right? That is why we use, why when you log on to Amazon, you will typically use your email address. Your number is not because you are just some small cog in the machine, although it may feel like that at 
you know, temple. But that's not the intention of giving you that ID. It's so that we can uniquely identify you and we're not going to violate federal law by accidentally giving you uh, some access to some other students' records. Um, so that ID is what we call a key, that unique ID. And it's able to pull up all the other stuff about you, your value, the values. So that's one use of the, this. Counting. Counting, you can use dictionaries for counting. Specifically, we, when we typically count, we count one thing. Like we were counting the number of times Dracula appeared in a sentence, right? We were counting the number of times count appeared in the novel, right? We, but we were counting one thing at a time. If you want to uh, count multiple things and you don't know what those things are, but say you wanted to like count multiple words, but you didn't know what the words you wanted to count were, you use a dictionary for that. Dictionaries are great for keeping track of a lot of different things, right? If you want to count the number of A's, B's, C's, D's, and F's in the class, right, we'd use a dictionary for that. We can use a dictionary for that. Categorizing, that's another kind of key value pair. But basically, if you want to create split something up into multiple categories, this is probably something we're going to see the least in this class, whereas counting is going to be the thing we see the most. Categorizing is useful. So what is this dictionary? In other languages, other languages really, it's, uh, they make a big deal about dictionaries and, or hash maps or associative arrays. They're called different things in different languages. But really, they're not too bad in, in our use. Uh, in the same way that we will create a list by using brackets, like th that creates an empty list, and then I could append, you know, four to this list, and then append five to this list, right? And here's my list now, four and five. Four is at index zero. And five is at index one. Sorry, five is at index one. And most importantly, I can't do something like this. Index two is equal to three because there's a certain set number of ind indexes I can use, right? Dictionaries instead are, use the same, are very similar, um, but they give you full control over what the indices are. So here, this is an empty dictionary. This is the curly brace, which if you press shift and the brackets is what you get access to. We call them the curly braces. Online, you might see them referred to as the curly boys, but um, they are your curly braces. So this is an empty dictionary. It has nothing in them. To create a key value pairing in a dictionary, you basically say, this is the key. So I'm going to say key three is equal to Andrew, which is my name. Oh, sorry, key five is equal to Andrew. So we don't refer to this as the index, although we use the same notation. We refer to it as the key. And now notice in the curly braces, we have five colon Andrew. That colon separates the key from the value. The key being, and the key, the, even though it's not an index, you can think of it a whole lot like the index because it acts exactly like the index. If I ask for what's at key five, it will tell me. If I ask for what's at key four, it's going to tell me uh, key error four. The key doesn't exist, right? You can think of it like a list where you define what the indexes are. So if I were to say D4 is equal to, let's see, um, Bob, and D3 is equal to Carol, five Andrew, four Bob, three Carol. One important thing to note about the, is about the order in which things appear in a dictionary is that it's not random, but it is unpredictable. You will not be able to correctly predict what order the key value pairs appear in. So just because they simply went in this order doesn't mean anything. So here, um, what am I? So I've got five Andrew, four Bob, three Carol. If I ask for D of key three, it will produce Carol. If I ask for D Carol, 
I'm not going to get anything back because it's going to say the error, key, you know, Carol doesn't exist. So use the keys to search for something. Does that make sense? Use the keys to retrieve something and use the val and the values are what the, that something is. Um, let's go ahead and see how we can, but they actually notice that it didn't say error, you can't use a string for a key. It said key error, which implies something extremely powerful. D color, with the key color, is equal to red. And now my dictionary has the keys 5, 4, 3, and color. If I ask for 5, it will give me Andrew. If I ask for 4, it will give me Bob. If I ask for 3, it gives me Carol. If I ask for color, it gives me red. Basically, it's a, it's a list where I can make up the indices however I want. That seems a bit unorganized and silly, but it's actually very powerful. For instance, um, if I wanted to basically count the certain the, the number of, so I'm going to show you the first um, the first use of this um, of this thing with our file reading example. So I'm going to use Dracula again. Um, so let's see. Now, you can, by the way, I'm going to say you can use the dictionary to do the Hawaiian pronunciation. You can use that. You don't have to use it. The pronunciation uh, homework, the Hawaiian homework was designed without the need for you to use um, dictionaries. But you can use it if you know how to use it. So I'll create, so let's go ahead and create this new file, classroom. Um, ITP, spring 20, no, nope, spring 2020, and it is file, files and dict.py. Okay, key value association. So, let's create a dictionary over here, and what I'm going to do so I'm going to open up this the Dracula file. So data is equal to open Dracula.txt. And I'm going to say, let's see. And I want it in read mode. And I want to count some specific things. So let's say I'd like to count the number of times count appears in the novel Dracula. I'd like to count the number of times that Dracula appears in Dracula. Let's count the number of times that count Dracula appears together, right? And let's also, for comparison, count the number of times the word the appears in Dracula. So notice that I haven't read anything yet, so I'm setting all my counts to zero. Make sense there? So if I were to print this, if I were to print this dictionary out, zero counts, zero for Dracula, zero for count Dracula, and zero for the. So now let's go through the file using fi uh, the file reading that we learned. So for line in data, that gets us the line. And now what we can do is we can say, hey, let's split up the line into a bunch of words. Words is equal to line.split. And that separates everything by um, by spaces, so we, everything is, in a, is a space by itself. Although, actually, that won't work for Count Dracula. So, boop, yeah, comment out Count Dracula. I'll just go with Count Dracula and the. So, 
words, so we split that. And now we can say for each word in the line, for word in words, if count in word dot lower, right, so it's converted all the lowercase so that we count both the capitalized and lowercase. If count is in the word lower, d count is equal to the amount, the number of times we've seen count before. Right, this variable, which is d count, is equal to the number of times I've seen count before, plus one because I've seen them one more time. And now I'm just going to copy paste. If Dracula is in that word somewhere. So Dracula, Dracula, Dracula's, comma, Dracula, Dracula. And then finally, if the for the I'm gonna be a bit more I'm gonna be a bit different. If the is equal to the word from 0 to 3, if it's equal to the first three, well, actually, if it's equal to the first three characters, so 0, 1, 2, and length of the dot lower, turn it into a lower case, and the length of word equal equals three. Because remember, you can have words like they, and I'm trying to avoid counting they in, in this, right? Because if it was in, if I were to do if the in word lower, then it will be, then that would count the and they and these and anything else that started with T-H-E. So here I'm asking, are the first three letters T-H-E? Actually, I can just simply ask. Actually, I can just simply add. So the reason I'm doing it like this, the first three letters, is that, well, actually, yeah, the won't have a comma after it, most likely, right? I can't imagine ending a sentence on comma. So I can just simply check if the is equal to word, and I think I'll be fairly safe there. Yeah, none of that. So if the is equal to word, I'll be fairly safe there because... It can start as the beginning of a sentence, like the count did this, but you're never going to get the as the end of a sentence, right? Right? Sentences don't end with the. Except for the previous sentence, which actually ended with the. So, so the, the is equal to d. Plus one more time. And now print D. Oof. So we've got our count of Dracula equal to 35, which is what, if you remember from Tuesday's lecture, is what we had. Count appears 260 times, and the appears zero times because apparently I'm not good at this. Um, so let's see. Oh, word dot lower did not call the, I did not execute the function call. Yes? Why exactly did you follow up with me for Because if, because if I were to do this, like I said earlier, which may, I didn't really do it like this, so, but if, if I did it like this, if the word is in, then that would, ca then that would, it would, we would register a hit on the, which is what we want, but we'd also register a hit on they and these and other stuff. Now for this one, I want to be able to register a hit on count, but also counts. And, uh, and for Dracula, I want to be able to register a hit on Dracula 
as well as Dracula's, right? Or Dracula, period, right? Because split only cuts out the spaces. It doesn't cut out the punctuation, right? So if we were to go through this, and let's go ahead and print a word. We'll go ahead and print word over here just to kind of show you. So here, I'm getting some stuff. Count country. Ooh, I'm getting country, which I don't want to count, actually. I'm getting count, count, country period. But then we get count period, which I would like to count. <laughs> All right. Um, so let's go ahead. And I also got a countermand and a count. So we're getting a bit. So we're getting a bit too many hits in in this. So let's go ahead and fix that. So if it's in there, yes, I guess. But um, but we don't want it to be. So one thing we could do is that we could. We should prop. Let's go ahead and then. See, so our main thing is actually. Is prop if we wanted to equal this, then we probably should. But then we won't get enough Dracula. We'll get only fourteen Draculas. So, because we're missing all the ones with periods and commas after it, and co and apostrophes. So what we'll have to do is that we maybe there's a magic function for each word that will clean a word up. If only your professor knew of such a function. I think I do, though, so that's good for me. Um, so there is a function. So we've learned about split. So let's go ahead and look at Python, the strip function. So splitting and stripping are very, uh, go, I use quite a bit to clean up text. Um, so left strip, right strip, and then strip. It returns a copy of the string with the leading and trailing sp uh, characters removed. In other words, it would remove, so, he, so let's go ahead and just do, so let's go ahead and see. S is equal to count period. S dot strip period will return count without the period. If cars is all right. So what about um, if count ends with a comma though? Stripping a period won't help there. It will still end with a, pop, a comma, right? So if I actually do comma period, it will select one of those guys. And so long as it begins or ends with the, with the period, it will strip it out from the end, beginnings and endings, which is important because if I were to do c.o.u.n.t dot dot strip period notice that it only stripped the ones at the end it doesn't get anything in the middle so this is kind of useful for keeping in apostrophes or something like that so What we can do now is that we can strip out punctuation. So word is equal to word.strip. And what we're going to do is that we're going to strip out common punctuation, comma, period, semicolon, exclamation point. Uh, and that should just about do it. Oh, and question mark. OK, and so now if we run this, we get, a lot, we get plenty of counts, but we're not getting any count apostrophes. So, but if we know that count apostrophes is going to be a thing, we can just simply say count or 
counts. Dracula or Dracula's. Now, the reason I'm talking so much about strings, by the way, is that if you're using Python at like a job that's not a programming job, if you're trying to use a lot of what you're going to be doing is string manipulation to automate what you're doing. So now we've got it. Dracula appears 31 times, 188 times over there. Um, not sure what we're missing for Dracula, but. So there, oh, probably because the Draculas is a thing as well. Plur, there's plural Draculas, as in the Dracula family. Or Draculas. Brought up the 32, so probably stuff like that. But the important thing is notice how the dictionaries are working here, right? We said these are the counts of things we want in dictionaries. Um, other and we count them up like that. However, I should point out that this is kind of just a limited use case of dictionaries. Dictionaries, in fact, are much are much more powerful because you can use them when you don't even know what words you're searching for. So this is one of the most common things you will you will do. Um, with a dictionary, and I guarantee that if dictionaries are on. This will either be on the next exam or the final because this is so common. Um, one of the things that we do in um, so one of the things that we learned about a bit when we were talking about cryptography uh, when we were doing XKCD was is that every language has a fingerprint. Um, so cryptography. So let's go ahead over here, right? Every language has a frequency of letters, right? So let's see, cryptography, let's see, frequency analysis. In cryptanalysis, yeah, cryptanalysis, frequently analysis, known as counting ledgers, the study of the frequency of letters. So, for instance, this is the typical distribution of letters in the English language. Notice that E makes up about 13% of all letters. So, let's go ahead and see how that, if that's, trans, if that's changed, like since in the past couple hundred years like with Dracula. So let's count all the letters as they appear in Dracula and see what the most common characters are. Okay, so um, let's go ahead and I'm gonna make a new one called um, Counting Cars. Oops, I wanna save it as a Python file dot py. Now you might be thinking that, great, it's going to be tedious because we're going to have to create a dictionary like this. Right? Dictionaries like this, and then I have to go a, don't write this, it's going to be way too tedious, a is equal to zero, and then do one for b, and then c, and then d, and e, or if I'm lucky, maybe I, there's a way to do it with the loop. Well, the answer is don't do it that way, that's silly. Basically, we're gonna use dictionaries to our advantage. We're gonna learn about, so we've learned how to put things into a dictionary, and we've learned how to get things out of a dictionary. We can put things into a dictionary by saying, hey, this is my key that I wanna store, and this is the value that I wanna store. Okay, that's how you put things in. To get something out, you give it the key, and out pops the value, whatever the value is. The value can be anything, anything at all. There's also a way to delete keys from it, but we don't really need to know about that. By the way, what do you think is going to happen if I say uh, D of key is equal to this, right? The key already exists. 
So what's going to happen? Any predictions? Based on what we were doing earlier? Sorry? It replaces it. So that's what's going to happen. If you give if you give the same if you do a key value combination where the key already exists, we just overwrite the old value. Pretty useful. Um, another thing we can do is we can use the in operation. We can say five in D. True, the key five exists. Red in D. False. So we're asking, is this key in the dictionary? Right? So you can ask, basically, is this index in use? So put thing, you can put things into a dictionary, you can retrieve things from a dictionary, and you can ask, is the key value pairing in the dictionary by asking for the key? Values we really don't care about. They don't tell us too much. If you really want to know, there's ways to do it. But we also can remove things from a dictionary, but that's a very rare operation. Um, if we ask for how big the key how big the dictionary is, it's going to tell us how many keys there are. Five of them. Also, while every key is unique, values don't have to be. So I could do D4. Is equal to Andrew. And now we have two thing we have two keys with the same value. No worries there. But that makes sense. If we can use dictionaries for counting, right, then it makes sense that multiple things can have this different counts. Or the same count. Okay. So let's go so let's go ahead and I'm gonna go just kind of go full tilt and Yes, I'm going very fast over it. This is one of those classic uh, Professor Rosen double passes where I'm going to go in, and this will probably be the subject of, the, uh, of the, our first set of flipped lectures in a bit more detail. Um, open. Let's go with uh, Dracula.txt again. Uh, we're going to go for read mode. And we're gonna, I'm going to call the file, instead of calling it data, I'm going to call it text because that sounds nice and it's still short, four letters. So four line in text, every single line is what? Every single line is a, um, is a string. Um, and the first thing I'm going to do is I am going to see if there's a difference between, split and uh, between strip and trim. Uh, Python trim trim spring a uh, string yep yeah, there is a there's a trim it's strip so the first thing I'm going to do is line is equal to line dot strip what's that going to do if I don't provide any arguments then if I didn't provide split any arguments, it's split along the white space. So if I don't provide strip any arguments, get any guesses what it's going to strip out? Sorry? Not everything. Only the spaces. Exactly. It's going to strip out spaces and new lines and all sorts of stuff that are on the end. So if I have any extra spaces at the beginning or the end, it's going to strip it out. Okay. So. Now let's go ahead and see for i in, so now for car in line, let's create our dictionary over here. We're just going to keep it empty for here. And basically this is the way it works. It's actually kind of brilliantly simple. Um, if car in D, have I seen this, ca sorry, actually I'm going to say, if the character is not in D, have I, in other words, have I not seen this character before? Is this the first time I've seen this character? If this is the first time I've seen this character, then guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to say uh, the number of times I've seen character is now equal to 1. Right? So I'm reading every single character in the, in the line. If I'm reading every single line in the text, and for every single character in the specific line I'm reading, if the, char 
character has not been seen yet, if it's a type of character that's not been seen yet, well, I've just seen that type of character for the first time, so I've seen it now exactly once. Else, I've seen that character before, which means I've counted, I have a count of that character, so it's in the dictionary. So I'll say, hey, the number of times I've seen that character, that's equal to the number of times I've seen this character, plus one. That's it. And now we just simply print it out. So we've got this weird UEFE Unicode character that appeared once. Okay. Uh, and let's see what we've got here. We've got the capital C appeared 505 times. Note that's not in not any kind of sorted order, by the way. Right? So um, D appeared 28,000 times. A appeared 51,000 times. E appeared 79,000 times. Apostrophe appeared, remember, because I was asking for characters. Um, was there anything else that appeared a ridiculously high number of times? Ah, we have a clear winner for the most common character in the English alphabet. The space. The space is always the most common letter in any document in English, even though it's most common character, but not most common letter. Why? Because every single because every single word has a space after it. So you have as many. So you're going to have as many of these suckers as you do words. Yes. Yes. Yes, can you sort them by their values? Yes. Is that exactly what you're asking? So I always forget how to do that in Python easily, but let's see, Python, sort, to, look at that. Number three, sort dictionary by value. It's a very common question uh, because it's annoying to do, I believe. So I'm gonna do it quickly anyway, um, which is, yeah, so we've got a lambda expression that somebody put over here. Um, Sorted key lambda x <laughs> sorted d is equal to yeah. So it can do the native sorting. It's annoying to do that, but um, ah but it's using that sorted dot d dot get it's all I'm like the issue is that they always want to throw in the lambda expression so there's not a really a um, a good easy way to do that because you can if you say sorted D says it's not going to really be able to sort it because guess what I've got a five a four a three a string a string and a string doesn't know how to sort those things but if I were to say sorted dot let's go back over to here I can so one thing I can do with with these by the way is I can print out the keys individually and I can print out the values individually And the issue is just sorting them at the same time. So here's our keys, and here's our values. So how do we sort them? Well, we can use this magic. I'm going to just use the magic phrase right now um, just to simply make it easier. So I won't expect you to know the magic phrase because it is magic. Um, and let me see. I didn't know you could do that with dictionaries. Print key. 
dictionary comprehension, key is equal to v for k v in sort. Oh, k f k in sorted items. The key is lambda. X is not defined, right, because it's not X. It is D over here. So we do have this sorted now. Um, we see the space E and T. Basically, sorting it is a challenge and might make an interesting question once we go over it at some point for an exam or a test. But this one-liner gets into magical lambda stuff. It doesn't look like any Python you've already, you've learned, right? It looks very, very weird. And this is because it's doing a comprehension um, as well as a lambda expression inside a function, which is all sorts of fun. Uh, but there is a way to do it. It's just that you can see from Stack Overflow that there's no like very, very easy way to do it that doesn't involve involve an annoying amount of work. Um, so that being said, we do have our dictionary, um, but I really was only concerned about the most common letter, right? So there's a couple ways we can do this. Uh, first off, let's go ahead and do line is equal to line dot lower to get rid of all the duplicates Right? There's no difference between uppercase C and lowercase C, or uppercase E and lowercase E. So let's just go ahead and get rid of those. Good there. As far as those weird non American letters, aren't real letters. I'm kidding. Um, but as far as these non -Amer American letters, I guess they can stay. But what we really need to get rid of those are those punctuations. In fact, actually, there's probably a way to do this. So one way we can say is for character in line, um, if car in A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, N, O, P, Q, R, S, T, U, V, W, X, Y and Z, thus proving I did go to preschool at some point. Um, there is an easier way to do that, which I'll show you in a bit, but I'm going to just want to show you effectively what I'm doing right now. So if the character is a letter, then I'll go into the rest of, the of those loops. So now I'm only going to count those letters. And that makes it much easier to see that um, E comes out on top. Also, notice that basically there's no rhyme or reason to where those letters are occur, to where the um, the keys appear in the in this. Um, I could do this though. I could print um, sorted D. If I print it sorted using the sorted function, well, that doesn't really help, right? It'll print out the keys that it sorted. If I do this, d dot items, which is all the key value pairs. Let's see if it will do that. It'll print out all the values in order like this, ordered by key. So we've got a, b, c, d, e. So we see E has almost 80,000 occurrences. Now there's an easier way to do this because writing out, I want to do this because you want a letter every single time is kind of annoying. Fortunately, Python strings have your back. Python string docs. In fact, I know exactly where it is on this page. ASCII letters. So if we do string.ascii letters, um, or string.letters, so let's go ahead and style if car in string, you might have to import string, by the way. String.letters, let's see what goes on here. 
It's gonna yell at me, string is not defined. Okay, so let's see, do I have to import string? There's, a, there's like three different ways. There's one way I know it will work. I'm just trying to see if there's a way that will do this. String has no attribute letters, makes sense. Okay, well that's easy enough. I can just simply say, hey, I just want an easy way to just do that. Um, I just want an easy way that doesn't make me look like I'm doing, like I'm breaking something because I know how I would do it and it looks horrible because the way I would do it is this. String object has no attribute letters, but you said you do. Are you lying to me now? I don't think, does it have parentheses? Because you have capitalized, which has that letters. Hmm, did I click on the wrong page? Oh yes. So string constants, the constants defined in this module are thus. Uh, I'm also on Python 2, which might have an issue. Here we go. String methods in lib string. So, ASCII lowercase. This is locale, not locale dependent and will not change. So, or do we have, ooh, yeah, no, we don't have letters, that's why. So I'll just simply do, at, I'll just simply do boom dot ASCII underscore lowercase. Yeah, they removed it from two to three. That was one of the issues. Oh, come on. It says, no attribute ASCII lowercase. If current string has no attribute in ASCII lowercase. Okay, what about string? Name string not defined. Okay, one last thing. Let's try again. One more. Import string. There we go. So import string, and you can suddenly use all the string constants. So if you import the string library directly, you can use a bunch of things that are already included in the strings, such as string ASCII lowercase. So here I'll boot up a Python interpreter. Here, I'll give you a chance to write it down because I realize I'm moving fast. Also, we're almost out of time, but that will be fine, but it's good. Yeah. Oh, excellent, excellent question. Uh, for key, for K in D, so for each key in the dictionary, print, key, comma, key, uh, D, and then the value that's associated with the key. Which is not sorted, mind you, but we will learn, but I think sorting will be the subject, uh, sorting these things and make, and organizing these things will be my uh, next video, just simply to make it a bit more sane and the one line lambda methods. Because um, I don't really want to get into lambda expressions. All right, so with the last five minutes of class, I really want to talk about what I expect you all to be learning in the remaining amount of time, which is I have a couple plans. First is string manipulation, which is what we're currently doing, plus learning about how to use dictionaries because they're super useful. The next thing we're going to learn is um, we're also learning file reading as part of that. We're going to learn a statistical method called the Monte Carlo method for approximating, uh, for doing approximations. And finally, you're going to learn regular expressions, which are like the most useful tool out there for doing text manipulation. Those are my plans. Um, if we have time left, we might, might we'll talk about manipulating PDFs and Excel files. Right. So. I look forward to seeing you all online and not infecting anybody else. Yes? Sorry?
I'm, I'm looking. I can't hear you. I'm sorry. I plan on having two online exams plus the final, which looks like it's also going to be online. 